to our Memorial Day ceremony in 2019. Color Guard, please post colors. Color Guard, okay. Or, ho! everybody for coming down here. Uh, I'm going to start off, Lloyd Grand Prix was probably as instrumental as anybody in getting the memorial built that we normally would appear in front of. Uh, Lloyd passed away on February 27th, so I'm going to ask for a moment of silence for him right now. heads and hearts to you, Lord, that we may remember those who paid the ultimate price by giving their lives for their country. We can never be grateful enough for the sacrifices made for our country, and we are humbled by their willingness to put their own lives aside for the benefit of others. Father, carve the sacrifices onto our hearts that we may never forget the loss of these heroes. We pray for this in thy holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Lenny. Now we'll turn it over to the color guard commander who will bring the ceremonies to attention. <coughs> Grief detail. Lay the memorial wreath. We lay this wreath in memory of all our deceased veterans. Honor Guard, Color Guard, present arms. ceremony. There's a few people here I'd like to thank. Uh, Gordy Cosfeld from KDHL announced it. Got everybody to come down here instead into the courthouse. Um, we always try and thank Mike Fitzpatrick for his PA system up at the courthouse. He's over there. <laughs> Thanks anyhow, Mike. <laughs> the thought was there. Um, we have three hundred people that we're honoring here today. Uh, Keith Paulson is our honored combat vet. I don't know if he's here or not. 
Jim Nielsen's a parade grand marshal. He's around here somewhere, and Steve Ernst is the honor of grand marshal. Um, <clears throat> our next ceremony will begin at 1045, the one that's normally at the at Central Park. That'll be right here. Now, Winnie, if you say a closing prayer for us. Move your head here. Father, today we pause to reflect on the sacrifices made by those who paid the ultimate price on behalf of our nation. We pray that these, their sacrifices are never forgotten, nor is the pain of their families. We acknowledge that freedom does come at a cost and pray that we can pursue peace and some days celebrate Memorial Day as a long ago memory of the time before we started living the peaceful existence you intended, O Lord, at the beginning of creation. On this Memorial Day, we pray for peace for those and for those that gave us all. Lead us toward a world where no one must give their lives in pursuit of freedom. May we be receptive to your guidance and we may never forget the fallen. Amen. Also want to thank the scouts. They normally help us present the flags, but as we didn't do that today, they showed up anyway, so we want to, want to thank them for their presence here. <laughs> this concludes our ceremony, so uh, the next one will be at 1045 for the ceremony that normally happens at Central Park. So, thank you. Memorial Day and I'm here at the American Legion Post 43 and we're here with two of our very very good friends both for the city of Faribault. Um, we have former Mayor Chuck Ackman and former Mayor Jeanette Hammond. So could you give me your thoughts today? I, I always show up at this thing or I try to always. I miss it some years with work. I've just been able to have the, the whole weekend off so of course I want to come down to this. Rain hasn't helped but it's inside but this is just a great little ceremony. It's only it's usually 10 minutes but it just gets right to the heart of what Memorial Day is all about and happy to do it. Thank you so much. And Jeanette, what are your thoughts? Mine are along the line of Chuck's but it's, it's a great get together. You, I think sometimes we forget how much freedom we have and I had uh, five brothers that served in the service and our granddaughter who is 19 just joined the Coast Guard and she is requested Hawaii and she got Antarctica and that is very typical of the service and and so uh, yeah I've had a lot of people in the military my father-in-law was in the wars and things like that my brother was in Da Nang and so I realize the freedom that we have because of these people. Well, we certainly thank your family for their continued service to the country. Well, thank you. Uh, they they enjoy it. They're learning. Our granddaughter that's on that, she's on the Polar Star Cutter, and that's one of the only ships that cut 14 feet of ice in the Antarctica, and she works in the engine room. So, yeah, so it continues on. 
Well, thank you so much. It's always good to talk to you and see you at these events. Oh, absolutely. It was just great to run into Jeanette. We haven't talked to each other in years and just to get caught up. And, and that's what events like this are all about, a sense of community and being here. So happy to be here. And before, you know, we couldn't get together and talk. <laughs> <laughs> now we can talk it was this. illegal, so but now now we at events like this we get to see all our former uh, workers, you know, and uh, elected officials, and it's fun. Chuck, your dad was very instrumental in the whole Veterans Memorial up in the courthouse. Can you give me some thoughts of that? Yeah, it's it's too bad that uh, it, it got rained out today because I haven't been up there since it's been basically completed. And I was, in fact, I did go up there this morning, and it was obviously not there, so I just assumed it was coming down here. But yeah, I mean, I'm trying to remember. I was mayor at the time, somewhere in the '90s. It was my dad, Lloyd Graham Prey, uh, uh, Herb Cook, and they just kind of had this idea and I remember dad talking to me at the time about the type of money they'd raise and I just shook my head and I said dad you'd be lucky to get 10% of that and how incredibly wrong I was and every time I look at that I think of that conversation and my dad just going no no I, I think we can do it and he was right and I was wrong and I don't I don't think there's anything I'm more happy to be wrong about than that one and just how many years dad just methodically slogged away on that one to raise the money and, and that's part of my Memorial Day. It's just a real special day for me and I try to make this program every year. Well, congratulations. Well, congratulations to him. I didn't do anything. <laughs> thank you again. Yeah, thank you. I'm here with Ms. Minnesota, United States, Crystal Shapi. Crystal, welcome back to Fairbo. Thank you. It's good to be home. I come back about every couple weeks or so to see my family down here. And this is what I used to come to every year when I was a kid. It was a big deal. Unfortunately, the rain did not help us. I went to the courthouse and we were told it was here. So it was great that everybody stayed dry and everybody still participated. What do events like this mean to you? They mean a lot to me because this, this is where you start. This is where the traditions start and generations start. You have to keep it going. You can't stop. And are you traveling around to other cities today? I'm going to go back out to Shieldsville where my family farm is and their event's at 1 o'clock at Herther Park. Thank you so much for taking the time to stop down. I know it means a lot to the guys. It means a lot to all of us here in Faribault. Thank you. There's a lot of family here. Thanks for having me. And now I'm here with Winnie Hughes, who is the chaplain for the American Legion Women's Auxiliary Unit 43. Winnie, can you give me some thoughts on today? This is a wonderful day. I feel that to keep in memory all of our veterans that have passed away. This is an uh, honor to be here for me as the chaplain of the Women's Auxiliary as we m keep the memory of them alive. We want our children, our grandchildren to be aware of this day and to never forget that the cost that many of these families have paid for our freedom. Thank you so much. And I also have John McDonough here, who is the president of the Central Vets Association. John, can you give me some of your thoughts on today? Well, because of the rain, we brought it down here to the Legion. We, we talked about keeping the ceremony up at the courthouse, rain or shine, because the people that were honoring didn't get the option of going inside when it was raining. But then we thought there might be a threat of lightning, and we just just decided to move it inside because of the danger but uh, that's why we're here is just to honor the people that have gone before us and have made this country what it is well thank you both so much for what you do for our veterans um, those that are currently serving and those who have served thank you so much for being here thank you for uh, what you guys do with it we really appreciate it thank you they say we should never forget and the best way to do that is by continuing to talk about the veterans who did not make it back from their battles. And with me today are three of our veterans here in Fairbo. Um, I have Bob Flum here with me. Could you tell me about one of these special people? Well, we had, uh, I grew up with Tom Eastman. He was from Kenyon, and he lost his life in Vietnam by friendly fire, they called it. So I was pallbearer for him when he got back to Kenyon. And... Uh, 
it's a pretty sad situation. It was really hard on the parents and all the friends that we ran around with, so it, it hit home. And John, can you tell me a little bit about this also? Well, Tom got drafted in the fall of 65. I joined the Air Force in January of 66. Tom went to basic training and then uh, advanced infantry training, and he was home on leave the last week of January when I left for basic training. He died on May 4th, and I didn't get home until after the funeral, so I missed the funeral. But when we started the memorial up at the courthouse, Bob and I talked about buying a paver for Tom. We were going to split the cost, and as word got out and other guys heard about it, 10 of us went in on it. So if you look on the website and look up Tom Eastman and look who, who paid for it, there was actually 10 people that contributed to his, and it, it's got a KIA up in the corner of it. And he's, the way they placed his uh, paver up there, Bob's on top, Tom's in the middle, and I'm on the bottom. So we got him covered. Such a great honor for you two. <clears throat> well, we thought that he should be honored. His parents had passed away, so we went ahead and did it. And then we bought him one for the Kenyon Memorial, too, which he's on the wall over there, too. And I'm also here with Jack Clausen. Jack, could you give me any idea about someone special in your life? Well, I'm uh, not a Faribault native. I grew up in St. Paul. Uh, I was in the Army during the Vietnam era. I was not in Vietnam. But when we had the wall here, two or three years ago and there was a couple of guys that I got an imprint on the wall from that one of them I went to school with and went to church with and he was a couple years younger than me his name was Tom Grinley and he lost his life in Vietnam and another guy I worked with when I was in high school and not just out of high school I worked at Montgomery Wards and I worked with this gentleman he was going to a Christian college and he got called to Vietnam and uh, his name was Boyd Garner and uh, he lost his life there too. So that's the two connections I had there. And I still remember those folks and you know, we'll always remember them. So. Well, thank all three of you for your continued service. And John? Uh, one other thing, when the wall was here, uh, Tom is on panel 7E, number 30. And when we tore the wall down, I got to put that panel back in the trailer. <laughs> Very special. Yeah, it was. Thank you all for your past service to our country and all that you continue to do. Thank you. We'll be getting the program on the way here in just a couple of minutes. Thanks for coming today. Obviously, Mother Nature do a little change in our plans, right? So we're going to pretend that we just got done marching on parade for the high school band pretending that right now. And we're going to stop here shortly. All right. Jerry's going to point to me because we're broadcasting this live on KDHL Radio. We've done this for many, many years. The program in Central Park for those who are in nursing homes and other facilities and can't be here. We think it's very important that they get a chance to listen to the program. So when Jerry points to me, that's when we go. Jerry's in the back. Everybody's looking to see where Jerry is, so. <laughs> we are on KDHL Radio, and we are ready to start a Memorial Day program. We think, we're not positive on this, but we think you are witnessing history today. This program has never, to the best of anyone's knowledge, been held indoors. So a round of applause to yourselves for history, right? <laughs> history. The parade, to the best of our knowledge, has not been canceled. It was canceled today due to obvious reasons. You would have felt feeling like ducklings out there watching the parade today. So the Faribault High School Band is going to get us started off. But first of all, before we do that, I just want to announce that the colors have already been posted. We had flag raising this morning here at this very facility, and they already posted the colors, right? Yes, yes. So we're just going to start out by Honor Guard, Dench Hut, Prezad, Arms. 
And now the national anthem by the Durable High School Band under the direction of Joe Timmer. Blessings of love and friendship for our families and our homes. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Wendy. You can be seated. This year we are observing a couple of milestones. They're actually three. I didn't remember the third one until I saw the patches on the Legion uniforms here that say 100. The American Legion is celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. 100 years of the American Legion. And so many good things in the community. That was the idea when the Legion came back from World War I, which was, at the time, right, the war to end all wars. And then little did they know World War II would come not that long after. This year we are also celebrating Faribault's sesquicentennial observance of Memorial Day. That's right. Memorial Day observances in Faribault, Minnesota have been going on since May 30th of 1869. That's just awesome. I get a tingle up my spine just thinking about that. That 150 years ago they were doing observances. Now, it's not to the extent we're doing today, right? The first Memorial Day, leadership of the Post the Grand Army of the Republic Post, the GAR, the post commander, Captain J.C. Turner, took command of the first march to the Good Shepherd Cemetery. They marked with colors and banners to those three cemeteries where flags and flowers were placed on the graves of fallen comrades with a ceremony of a reading of scripture and a prayer by Reverend M. Du Bois. I researched and I couldn't find what church Mr. Du Bois preached out. I checked the websites of every church pretty much in town. <laughs> so I'm sorry I couldn't bring you that bit of information. Also, June 6th, not that far off, will be the 75th anniversary of the D-Day operation during World War II. I'll be sharing a story about that a bit later. But we've got a local connection to the D-Day invasion that I wasn't aware of until Jim Nielsen, who's our Grand Marshal this year, mentioned this on a radio show last Friday on KDHL Radio. One of the co-owners, one of the original co-owners of KDHL Radio was Palmer Dragston. The D is for Dragston, 
The H is for Jack Hyde, and the L is for Herb Lee, the founders of KDHL Radio. Palmer Dragston gave the command to invade Normandy. Operation Overload, I think is what they call it, or Overlord Operation. He gave the initial command. He reported directly to Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower told him when to tell the people to go to the beach. That's a local connection here with D-Day, which was huge. We'll talk about that a bit later. Are there any Faribault City Council members here today? If you'd still, if you'd rise, or there's the mayor, I see. If you'd rise, raise your hand. We want to we want to thank you for coming here today. Uh, yes, round of applause. Yes. Any county commissioners here today? Or, you know, I realize that things have been, usually we see them in Central Park, at least one or two representatives of the county commissioners. Any state senators, state representatives, usually they're able to make it to Central Park. They're probably all tuckered out from all night session Friday into Saturday morning, right? That's when the session got over Saturday morning, the special session. So thanks to those honored guests for coming. We will now have our honored guests come up here if they want to and share a story with us. Our Grand Marshal, ladies and gentlemen, I probably should give a little bio on him, shouldn't I? Our Grand Marshal this year is Jim Nielsen. Born in Tyler, Minnesota, April 19, 1946. Jim told us Friday on KDHL that after college he got out and got what he expected, a draft card in the mail. He entered the U.S. Army March 9, 1969, basics in Kentucky, advanced infantry in Louisiana, then Virginia for six months of advanced engineering. Next in Maryland at Army Intelligence School, followed by six months at Fort Bragg for Chemical Warfare School. He joined the 525 Military Intelligence Group in Vietnam for a year, was discharged in October of 1971. Jim and his wife Ellen have raised their family and still live right here in Faribault. Ladies and gentlemen, the Grand Marshal, Jim Nielsen. Thank you, Gordy. And a big thank you to the Central Vets. I consider this a tremendous honor to be uh, chosen to be Grand Marshal. <clears throat> As Cordy uh, pointed out, uh, I graduated from college one day, got my draft notice the next, and uh, I kind of had a pretty good idea what was going to be in store for me for a while. <clears throat> this was 1968-1969, and the Vietnam War was really heating up. I just uh, saw in 1967 they had 150,000 troops at the start of the year and the next month they had 175,000 the next month they had 200,000 and by the end of 1967 I think they had 400,000 troops in Vietnam. When I arrived in Vietnam <laughs> one of the first things they asked me is can you write? I thought, oh, that's kind of a dumb question. I, you know, graduated from high school, graduated from college. And anyway, it led to me uh, being in charge of the resources data division. I held the uh, position of, of a major as a young first lieutenant. I had 26 intel teams from the Delta to the DMZ. We would, we would receive requests from all four branches of the service for intelligence. I would attach them to whatever teams I thought could get that intelligence and then uh, distribute it back to the unit's request. We get about 40,000 reports in a year. One report that whenever we got that would show the North Vietnamese units traveling that had an American soldier with them. Those reports went directly to the Pentagon so that they could track every known POW and where they were moving them to and where they were going. I can tell you I learned more in one year in Vietnam about people, people under stress and how they reacted than I have in all the other years of my life. 
And I was uh, come home, and we were out processed in San Francisco, and I had my uh, ticket to fly home. And uh, at that time, you'd fly either military reserve or military standby, and we were told, do not wear your uniform. The airlines did not want to put up with all the stuff that was going on with someone in uniform. And I can tell you that's kind of depressing when you've just come from a war to find out that you're not welcome to wear your uniform on an airplane. But that was the time and that's what went on. <clears throat> Shortly after, I uh, got lucky, got a job with the state of Minnesota as a probation officer and ended up in Rice County. And I had, uh, I kind of vowed I was never going to go to a parade and I really didn't want to participate in any of that anymore. I was to say I was uh, disillusioned would be pretty close to correct. Well, luckily when we uh, first got married, we bought a house on the east side and I had a neighbor that many of you know by the name of Storm and Norman, Norm Rost. He convinced me that I should get active in the Legion and uh, I did. And then they convinced me I should march with the color guard. And here, the guy that said, I'm never going to another parade. And I want to tell you, when I marched down Central Avenue carrying that American flag, a lot of healing went on that day. A lot of healing. And since that time, I am proud to say I've been active in the American Legion, the VFW, Vietnam Veterans of America, Disabled Vets. As a nation, we've seen so many of them go out of their way to say thank you for your service these days. Something that didn't happen when I first come home. I can't tell you how many times I could be on the street and someone will see I've got a Vietnam veteran's hat on, they'll come over and say thank you for your service. And it feels good. There are only two entities in the world that are willing to die for you. The first was Jesus Christ and the second was the American soldier. Jesus died to save our souls, the American soldier to save our freedom. One and a half million have died in the total from the wars in the United States. We don't know them all, but we owe them all. We owe them all a big debt, or we wouldn't be here today. And I will close with John, the 10th chapter, 28th verse. And I give you eternal life to them that they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Amen. Our honorary Grand Marshal this year is Steve Ernst, born in Faribault January 22nd, 1948. Joined the Navy in 1966, had his basics in Chicago, was sent to Florida for a year, then to the Azores Islands where he was a naval storekeeper for 19 months, next stop an aircraft carrier as an aviation storekeeper, nine months sailing the Mediterranean where the ship visited Italy, Greece, France, Spain, and England. He was discharged in July of 1970. Still volunteers, just like Jim does for many Faribault American Legion Pulse 43 events. Steve and his wife Pat still live here in Faribault. I present you with Steve Ernst. <laughs> That's fine. Steve, another round of applause please for Steve. combat veteran being recognized this year is Keith Paulson and he would also like to have us honor his service dog Molly. Born July 4th 1962 in Zimbrota, Keith entered military service in July of 1981. After basic training in New Jersey and advanced training in Missouri, 
He went to jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia, then on to the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. After being discharged in 1987, he returned home, but when the Twin Towers were struck, he enlisted in the National Guard and was assigned to the 34th Infantry Red Bulls. In the Guard, he served tours in Panama, Grenada, and Iraq. He was discharged in 2013. He and his wife, Jen, have five children. On AM Minnesota last Friday, a talk show that we do on KDHL, Keith told listeners when he returned home after serving in the Middle East, he had some problems with being over anxious. And it was suggested that he get a service dog, but he balked at that. He, I don't want a service dog. But he eventually was convinced, and he told us, and he'll probably share this with you too, that that dog has been a lifesaver for him. Molly. He said Molly has really helped calm him down. I'll let him tell the story. Keith Paulson. And of course, Molly. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your day to stand with us in recognition and honor of all who have paid the ultimate sacrifice to this nation. My name is Keith Paulson. I live here in Fairbault with my wife. Together we have five ch adult children and are raising our four grandchildren. I grew up in Bern, Minnesota, between West Concord and Pine Island, on a dairy farm. I entered the military just out of high school and left my mark on the 82nd Airborne Division in North Carolina. I remember being told by a jump master, you will do more, see more, in the next four years than most people will in their entire life. It's hard to imagine, but for some, that is true. I learned without honor and integrity, a man has nothing. I served later during Grenada and realized it was, not, it was not much more than an argument between neighbors compared to the more recent battle, uh, wartime battles. Uh, many veterans organizations today struggle Many veterans today continue to struggle with physical injuries, invisible injuries, employment, financial, and relationship issues. We the people have turned a blind eye to the politicians and lawmakers who allow our country to be overrun by silent but deadly enemies of our nation. I say it's time to wake up America. We are losing the battle. I remember telling my beautiful wife when I was in Iraq that you can talk to anyone about anything as long as you have mutual respect. But a true enemy has no respect. Three of my comrades learned this in Iraq one fatal July night when they were killed by incoming mortar fire. I was getting packed up to head home to the U.S. for leave to enjoy some much needed R&R &R and attend a good friend's wedding. But standing in replacement of our fallen heroes and constantly walking past the blood-stained walls is how I spent my time. I stand so that they will never be forgotten. Specialist Carlos Wilcox, age 27. Specialist Daniel Drevnik, age 22. And Specialist 
James Wordish, age 20. Freedom is never free, my friends. May God bless every one of you and the freedom you enjoy daily. I would like to close by saying, light them up, smoke them if you got them. <laughs> We will now have the dedication of the Memorial Cross. Karen Rasmussen, who is the president of the Legion Auxiliary, and the future president, Jeannie Bowers, will be doing the honors here. First, in memory of Abraham Lincoln, the gold wreath. Next, martyred presidents. Boys in blue and those lost in southern battlefields. The Spanish-American War. World War I and World War II. Sailors, Marines, Army, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, Air Force. Men and women of the Korean War. Veterans of Vietnam. The unknown soldier at Arlington and all unknown deceased. Granada and Lebanon. Panama Desert Shield Desert Storm. Somali, Bosnia, and all undeclared conflicts. The fallen on 9-11 and the current war on terrorism. The Rice County Central Veterans Association Honor Guard would be doing a salute to the deceased. We will now have the playing of our taps. All please rise. Honor Guard, Tench Hut, Presat, Arms. But first of all, we want to hear a musical selection here from the Faribault High School Band. I almost forgot. <laughs> Sorry about that. They're going to do the Armed Forces on Parade for us.
I said earlier, June 6th will be the 75th anniversary of the D-Day operation. My dad was stationed in France about a year after D-Day, a little less than that actually. He enlisted in the Army at the age of 28 at Fort Snelling on March 14, 1945. Suffered a permanent injury during a training exercise. Received his medical discharge November 3rd of 1946. Bernard Dargos lived almost long enough to join the celebration on June 6th, marking 75 years since the D-Day, when he waded onto Omaha Beach as an American soldier to help liberate his homeland of France from the Nazis who persecuted his Jewish family. Just shy of his 99th birthday, Dargos died earlier this month. To the strains of his beloved jazz, he was laid to rest at France's most famous cemetery. An even smaller number of veterans will stand on Normandy's shores June 6th for the D-Day's 75th anniversary. Many will salute fallen comrades from their wheelchairs. As each year passes, more first-hand witnesses to history are leaving us. I shared earlier what Jim told me about Palmer Dragston, one of the original owners of KDHL, putting out the order to charge. On, you did the communications of D-Day that day. More than two million American, British, Canadian, and other Allied forces were involved. It was history's biggest amphibious invasion, and the ensuing battle for Normandy helped pave the way for Hitler's defeat. Darglos outlived most of them, knew the importance of sustaining their memory. In a 2012 memoir, he wrote, and I quote, I am convinced that we have to talk about the war to children so they understand how much they need to preserve the peace. Until the end, Dargos battled complacency, intolerance, and Holocaust deniers who claimed that D-Day was just a movie. In recent years, his granddaughter said, and I'm quoting her, seeing any type of violence, of anti-Semitism and racism, either in France, Europe, or the United States, really upset him. <coughs> Normandy school teachers, veterans' families, and military memorials are laboring against time to record survivors' stories for posterity. On that fateful June 6th, some 160,000 Allied forces came ashore to launch Operation Overload to wrest Normandy from Nazi control. More than 4,000 Allied forces were killed on that day alone. Nearly half a million people were killed on both sides by the time the Allies liberated Paris in August of 1944. There is no firm number of D-Day veterans known to be alive today. The survivors would be in their 90s or 100s. Of the 73,000 Americans who took part, just 30 are scheduled to go to France for this year's anniversary on June 6th. The U.S. Veterans Administration estimates about 348 American World War II veterans die every single day. All but three of the French forces involved in D-Day are gone. Dargos wanted to be in Normandy this year. It meant a lot to him. His story is both unusual and emblematic. Born in France, he left Paris in 1938 for New York. He went there to learn his father's sewing machine trade. He watched from afar, sickened as the Nazis occupied his homeland. His Jewish relatives were sent to camps or fled in fear. Determined to fight back but skeptical of French General Charles de Gaulle's resistance force, he joined the U.S. Army instead. With the 2nd Infantry Division, Dargles sailed from Britain on June 5th. He made it to Normandy on June 8th. 
After three unforgettable days on choppy seas, the road he took inland from Omaha Beach now bears his name. The battle to wrest Normandy from the Nazis took longer than Allies had thought, but for Dargos, the prize at the end was invaluable. When he made it to Paris, he went to his childhood apartment, and there was his mom, still alive. He didn't think she would be. She was there. Can you imagine the emotion? Unexpectedly alive. For four decades, he really didn't talk much about the war, but as more and more survivors died at his granddaughter's urging, he realized the importance of speaking out and sharing his stories with schools and journalists. At his funeral, friends and family remembered him as a shy but courageous man, a lover of oysters and pastrami sandwiches, known for his mischievous smile. Joe Abet, his granddaughter, told the Associated Press of his yearning for leaders who, quote, bring people together instead of dividing them. Dargos would have had a very clear message for the D-Day anniversary, she said. I'm quoting her. This would be his message, according to her. Never take democracy for granted. Dictatorship is always a bad solution. Violence is always a bad solution. Keep democracy alive. Fight for democracy, for freedom, for peace. The cultural director at Normandy's World War II Memorial frets about its fading message as she watches school children cycle into that museum every day. She says, and I'm quoting her here, the parents and grandparents of 13-year-olds today did not experience the war. So the family stories, the family history, where helmets are brought out, where we spoke about what it was like, has been lost. She adds, again quoting here, they don't know the names of the landing beaches. Pupils spend less time studying World War II than they did 30 years ago, and so the role of D-Day has been reduced. Dargles himself worried about the day when all of the veterans from that era are gone. He wrote in that 2012 memoir I told you about, and I quote him here, it could start again. We must be vigilant at all times. That's the message. This story that I saw in the Associated Press thought I'd share with you today. Winnie Hughes is going to come forward and present the benediction. Thank you, Gordy. Please stand. Dear God, does anyone remember in a world that is on the fast track of life? Does anyone think of the past of those who served our country through wars and strife? Does any, anyone remember brave men and women who went across the seas leaving loved ones in comforts of home? They went to strange lands in crowded ships dreaming of a sweetheart or family with their thoughts all alone. Does anyone remember? the tears of sadness on hearing the news of a death, casualty of war, they say, loss of a son, father, brother, husband, the tremendous sacrifice of keeping the enemy away. Does anyone remember how vast was the price of freedom in a land where history is not taught, where memories are lost, flashbacks, loss of mind or limbs, those who have suffered so much, this is the cost. Does anyone remember? Yes, thank God for the 150 50 years of concern of the veteran posts and auxiliary units, now and those before, there to comfort and serve in many ways, to dry tears, cheer, give hope, and then to pray for strength to do more. Yes, some do remember. 
It is given to all of us the task of remembering why there is freedom in the USA. Let us never forget to remember. Amen. And Jack has a final note here. Before we stop, I want to let you know that you're invited to attend a veterans commemoration at 1 o'clock this afternoon as well. It's at the All-American Veterans Memorial in Shieldsville. They've moved it to the shelter, which is in the Hurdler Park there in Shieldsville. We're going to, re to retire the colors in place. Honor Guard, Tan Chut. Present arms. Order arms. Arrayed rest. Honor Guard, Tan Chut. Dismissed. Anybody that stays around here for a while now, there is going to be lunch. I'm not quite sure what time it starts. What time does lunch start? When it's ready. <laughs> when it's ready. How's that? Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. There's a brief program, too, with that lunch. That's why this table has been set up, and it'll all be explained to you during that program. Typically, it starts at noon. <laughs> Thanks again for coming.
12 days to go. We're gonna, we won't be posting college because we're already posting. So we're gonna start out with an opening prayer by winning news. We are thankful, Father, for all blessings you have given to us and for the fellowship we have shared with those here. We ask that you heal those who could not be here with us today. As always, we pray for our service persons and for their safe return to their families. We thank you, Lord, for this meal, for those who prepared it, and for those who whom we share it. We ask that we be strengthened with thy grace as we strive to keep American one nation under God. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, next, we're going to do the POWMIA, and we're going to do it at the table on the stage. A little bit of a easier for you to see. Today, we pay tribute to the men and women who have served our nation unselfishly. Within each of us lies the American spirit, a burning desire to dedicate and commit ourselves to the American ideals of freedom. This desire is deep within the heart and soul of each soldier, sailor, airman, president, marine, and coast guardsman. It is undaunted by weather conditions, living conditions, or hardship of mission. When the bells of freedom first rang out, we were there at Bunker Hill, Lexington, and their brutal winter at Valley Forge. Thousands of us gave our lives at Bull Run, Manassas, Antietam, and Gettysburg. We rode with Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders up San Juan Hill. Whenever and wherever America called, we were there. We fought battles of the Marne and Chateau Theory in World War I. We were at the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes Forest, and all along the European front of World War II. We endured Corregidor. We survived the Bataan Death March. We raised a flag at Iwo Jima. We landed at Utah and Normandy on D-Day in 1944. We have never failed to answer our country's call. We fought the unrelenting fight at the 38th parallel, better known as Korea. We trudged through their patties and jungles of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. We were the 241 Marines killed in Beirut. We were the pilots who flew the mission, daring mission against Libya and international terrorism. America has always counted on us. We were the peacekeepers in the Sinai, liberators of the tiny island nations of Granada, restorers of democracy in Panama, victors in the sand of the Middle East. We were givers of hope in Somalia and Bosnia. America's military has always been the beacon of freedom, shining for all to see. We have marched with our heads held high and served with pride. Through all the periods of war in American history, our question remains unanswered. Where are our brothers, our prisoners of war, our missing in action veterans? This is not an absence of choice, but rather one which emulates duty, honor, and country. Let us remember their absence. We'll remember their absence with a moment of silence. We call your attention to this small table which occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is set for one symbolizing the fact that members of our armed forces are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as POWs and MIAs. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and families. 
so we join together to pay humble tribute to them and to bear witness to their continued absence. The table is small, symbolizing the family of one prisoner alone against his or her suppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose in the vase signifies the blood they may have shed in sacrifice to ensure the freedom of our beloved United States of America. This ruse also reminds us the, of the family and friends of our missing comrades who keep the faith while awaiting their return. The yellow ribbon on the vase represents the yellow ribbons worn on the lapels of the thousands who demand, with unyielding determination, a proper account of our comrades who are not among us. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless volunteers of families as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us at this time. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope which lives in our hearts and to illuminate their way home, away from their captors, in to the open arms of a grateful nation. The American flag reminds us that many of them may never return and have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. That concludes the MIA and POW ceremony. So, uh, <clears throat> Deb will start releasing the tables now to uh, go ahead and start eating. I'm Jan Peeper. I'm here at the American Legion where the luncheon has just concluded. And I'm here with today's honored combat veteran, Mr. Keith Paulson. How are you today? Just fine. Now, I know that you served in the Army. Can you tell me the, your, your date of service and where you served? Uh, yeah, in uh, 1981, I went into the military. Uh, I was, I served. Uh, at the 82nd Airborne Division in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I know that your service didn't stop there. No, uh, right I signed up right after 
uh, 9-11 and I was in the National Guard and I went to Iraq from there. And you spent eight years in Iraq? No, the, uh, I only spent a year in Iraq. And earlier today, as we've talked about so much, that what we don't want to do is forget those, your brothers who didn't come back home. Can you tell me a little bit about three that you spoke, spoke of earlier? Uh, they, were, uh, they were in our unit. Uh, they uh, had a, a, a mortar rocket fired at them. Uh, they were killed, and after that, um, I came back from leave, uh, from being on leave in the United States, and uh, I replaced their job, uh, essentially replacing them when I came back. And what, if anything, can you tell us about your brothers? they'll always be missed. I stand here today to stand for them. And what does a ceremony like this mean to you? Um, it means a lot. It, uh, it means tradition. Uh, it means um, honor, respect for your country. Um, these are things that I, you know, I carry on my on my wrist, honor and integrity, and if you, for men, if you don't have honor and integrity, you don't have anything. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and for sharing your story, and thank you also, sir, for your service to our country. Thank you. We would like to invite his family in. I know they're around. Okay, we have his family now. They're all behind you. And could you just read us the three names of your brothers? Uh, Specialist Carlos Wilcox, age 27. Specialist Daniel Drevnik, age 22. James Wordish, age 20. Thank you. And like we said, when we talk about them, they're never forgotten. Thank you. And now I'm here with Jim Nielsen, who was supposed to be the Grand Marshal in today's parade, but due to the weather, that didn't happen. Um, Jim, you served in the U.S. Army. Can you tell me when you served and where you served? I can. I uh, was drafted right out of college. Um, I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky for basic training, and then I was down to Fort Polk, Louisiana for advanced infantry training. When you come into Fort Polk, it says, Welcome to Tigerland, home of the infantry soldier for Vietnam. And how many years did you serve, sir? <laughs> Well, a total of two years and 10 months. And when I was there, they convinced me to go to OCS, and then they sent me to Fort Belva, Virginia for six months of uh, engineer training. And then they sent me to Fort Holleburg, Maryland for military intelligence training. And then they sent me to Fort Bragg for chemical warfare school. And I did teach there for about six months, and then I spent my last year in Vietnam. <clears throat> now, I know that you have a long lineage of service in your family. Yes, uh, my great-grandfather fought in the civil, sixth Minnesota, the Civil War. He actually farmed between Fairbolt and Kenyon. We found over in Goodyear County Historical Society where he'd signed up for the 6th Infantry. <clears throat> my great-uncle was in World War I. I had several uncles in World War II. I was obviously in Vietnam, and my youngest son was a Marine. At, he actually drew two months combat pay in East Timor. So. Uh, yeah, long time. <clears throat> what does Memorial Day mean to you? Well, I think we, we really look at all the people who never came back. And uh, we all served, and they're saying we all gave some, but some gave all. And, I, you know, we always, you just have, it just, 
mind-boggling when you think about how many people in the history of this country have died preserving freedom. And like I said, I don't know them all, but we owe them all. Are there any of your brothers that did not return that you could tell us about? Well, you know, probably the hardest ones to talk about is the ones that come home. Uh, one of my buddies that stepped on a landmine, lost both legs and an arm. <clears throat> uh, I always thought that that was the worst case scenario to me. I, uh, if I'm dead, I'm dead. But to come back with no arms and no legs or whatever, I, uh, it's hard hard to imagine. And, <clears throat> and I had... Uh, three or four real good buddies that uh, didn't make it back and <clears throat> uh, you always remember them. Well thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for your service to our country and thank you for all you do for all veterans. And thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. It really is. And now I'm here with a very special group of ladies. Can you tell me your name please? Kayleen Karen. And you are part of, I hear it's called the American Heritage Girls and your unit troop 3100. Can you tell me a little bit about this group? Uh, American Heritage Girls was founded in the mid 90s in Ohio and it's an offshoot from the Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts mission began to change and so the founders of AHG decided to keep it very true to the core beliefs of Girl Scouts. So that's how American Heritage Girls was founded. Our purpose is to build women of integrity through acts of service to our God, our family, our country, and our community. And their community service today had to do with water on the tables. I saw them refilling water. They helped clear off um, the tables afterwards. Um, did you have fun? Yeah. And what was the best part of today? I don't know. It was all really fun. And what do you think you would, would you do this again? Sure, I would. And did you learn anything new today? That it is really fun to work and serve people. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, maybe we could get your names too. I'll start with you. Lily. I'm Cecilia Karen. I'm Kayleen's daughter. I'm Story James. Casey. Well, you guys all did a terrific job today. I saw you scurrying around, and you kept pretty busy. So thank you so much for all that you did to help our veterans on this very special day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From the American Legion, Post 43, I'm Jan Pieper for FCTV. I'm Jan Pieper. I'm here at the American Legion Post 43. It's after Memorial Day, but we're here with the veteran that was selected as the Honorary Grand Marshal, Steve Ernst. Steve was unable to talk with us on Veterans Day, so I'm going to help him tell his story. So let's get started. After high school, you and two of your friends from Fairbo enlisted in the Navy in 1966. You went directly to boot camp at the Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago. From there, he went on to the Naval Station in Pensacola, Florida for about a year and a half, where he did building maintenance and then transferred over to Aviation Supply. Then he moved to a Naval Station off the coast of Portugal, known as Azores, for about 19 months. He became an Aviation Storekeeper with a rank of E-4. He maintained inventories of goods and provided ships and aircraft with the supplies they needed. For the rest of his deployment, he was transferred to the USS Forstall. He ended up with four years in service. When asked, Steve said that on Memorial Day, he has thoughts of his family and friends and the men that he served with and enlisted with, who he was able to see when he returned in about 1970 when his service was over. He's enjoyed being involved with the American Legion for about the last 43 years. He's been a past commander of the American Legion, serving as the commander in 1998. He's also been very active in the post, helping with the kitchen. He has been serving with the color guard and now the honor guard. 
He was honored to be chosen as the Honorary Grand Marshal and would like to thank the Rice County Central Veterans. We want to thank you, Steve, for your service and for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you, Jan. Pleasure hearing all that background. Uh, I just want to thank everybody again, and uh, hopefully we all can get together for Veterans Day. Thank you.